bottling down to 76 percent. Good afternoon, everyone. This is our post-launch news conference for Mars Science Laboratory and Curiosity, launched this morning on an Atlas V rocket, and here to talk about Curiosity and its uh, state of health on the way to Mars and the agency's reaction to this launch is Pete Teisinger, the Mars Sabor uh, Science Laboratory Project Manager from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, John Grotzinger, the MSL Project Scientist from the California Institute of Technology, and Doug McQuistian, the Director of the Mars Exploration Program at NASA Headquarters. And we'll start first with the MSL project manager, Pete Teisinger. Pete. Good afternoon. Um, our spacecraft is in excellent health, and it's on its way to Mars. Okay. And questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'll talk about the spacecraft health in a second, but I want to uh, give a tremendous thanks to the uh, to the launch team, ULA, and uh, and to uh, the launch service provider organization here at Kennedy, um, and to Kennedy Space Center, who's been our, our uh, have hosted us since uh, since we arrived in May and, and June, and 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 built up the spacecraft and did final testing here, and finally encapsulated for flight. They did a tremendous job today. They've done a tremendous job for all these months, and it was a it was a fantastic uh, and smooth operation today, really just first rate and, and tremendously professional. Um, as I said, the spacecraft is in excellent health. Uh, you may have gotten seen pictures of the separation with those fantastic photographs. And uh, um, we separated uh, uh, perfectly on time, of course, and, and uh, the acquisition of signal was, as expected, about six minutes later, uh, 155227, if, uh, if you want to know, uh, Zulu. Um, the power, uh, we are power positive, slowly charging the batteries. We did not lose that much state of charge, in fact, during the ascent profile. Uh, we're thermally as expected. Uh, the uh, cat bed heaters for propulsion are on. The temperatures are as we expect them on the key pieces of equipment. And we're changing slowly, as you'd expect, as we transition from uh, ground-based to space operations. We are in cruise mode. Um, we have uh, commanded the spacecraft. Uh, and we have are therefore in two-way and are getting, getting navigation data. Uh, the injection was first rate. Um, much less than a tenth of a sigma is both both ULA and our navigation estimate. So it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic, uh, accurate injection. And, and that's about it for me. Very uh -huh. happy guy. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. And now John Grossinger, the project scientist from the California Institute of Technology. John. Well, I'm also uh, really excited, I, I think, on behalf of every scientist on this miss uh, mission, and there are about 250 of us. Uh, I would like to thank every engineer at, at JPL, everybody that has worked so hard for uh, almost 10 years to build the spacecraft, put it together, all the principal investigators who have dedicated their lives to building the instruments uh, for just as much time, and all their team members that have helped with getting surface operations. We are ready to go uh, for landing on the surface of Mars, and, and we couldn't be happier. Uh, I think this mission will be uh, a great one. It is an important next step in NASA's overall goal to address the issue of, of life in the universe. We are not a life detection mission. We have no ability to detect life present on the surface of Mars. And it is important to distinguish that as an intermediate mission between MER, which was the search for water, and future missions, which may undertake life detection. Our mission is about looking for ancient habitable environments and a time in the history of Mars that is very different from the time, from the conditions that you see today on the surface of Mars. We have a lot of evidence that has brought us to a single landing site, the result of six years of deliberation over more than 50 potential landing sites. The engineering system on this mission that will land us on the surface of Mars for the first time in the history of any landed mission to Mars gets the scientists to exactly where they wanted to go. There's no compromise. We are going to the very best place that, that we could find to go to, and I just can't wait to get on the ground. Thanks, John. Now Doug McQuistian, the director for NASA's Mars <coughs> Exploration Program at NASA headquarters. Doug. Ecstatic is the word. 
Um, I mean, the agency has been working this mission hard with uh, JPL and all the, the other organizations such as Department of Energy, our international partners, uh, and now KSC and ULA have uh, put us right where we wanted to be. Um, moving fast, cruising to, cruising to Mars, um, hot, straight, and normal, right? In good shape. So the agency is ecstatic. I mean, we have started an era, a new era of exploration of Mars with this mission, not just technologically, but scientifically, as John said. Um, I hope we have more work than the scientists can actually handle. Uh, once we get to the surface, I expect them all to be overrun with data that they've never seen before. Um, I expect the public to have images, vistas that we've never seen before either. Down in the bottom of uh, Gale Crater when we land, those first images are going to just be stunning, I believe. Uh, it'll be like sitting at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, I think. So we are, uh, we are absolutely ecstatic. Can't wait to get to Mars. Uh, also need to thank the JPL team, Pete, you and your guys, John, for, uh, for getting us to this point. Uh, it's an enormous mission. It's uh, equivalent of three missions, frankly, and uh, quite an undertaking. Science fiction is now science fact. We're flying to Mars. We get, him on the, get it on the ground and see what we find. Thank you, Doug. We're ready now to take questions. Please give your name and your affiliation when the microphone comes to you. Let's start here in the front with Marsha. Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, probably from Mr. Theisinger. Um, but, you know, we've heard that the Bermuda Triangle awaits you. Um, how, is that even on your mind today? I mean, are you quickly putting the launch behind as a success and now looking forward to this eight-month cruise or? What launch? What launch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, well, you can't. You know, we've, we've clearly been thinking about intercept landing for, for quite a while as well as thinking about the surface mission for a while. But you got to, you know, today's today. And, and we need to let everybody uh, enjoy the moment. We, we all recognize this is a prologue for the mission, uh, necessary but not, I mean, but not sufficient. And, uh, and we all have our work cut out for us in the next eight and a half months to prepare for a, a surface mission and do the final uh, eye totting and T crossing for EDL. But, but today's a great day. Right here. Uh, Jim Siegel, Celebration Independent Newspaper. I believe this one might be for Doug. Um, I noticed uh, in some of the press uh, materials that we received, there have been maybe 20 or 30 different missions that have been to, sent to Mars uh, or at least attempted since 1960. And there are several that are planned, or perhaps not budgeted, but at least planned. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what the next step is after, uh, after Curiosity and the Mars Science Laboratory. Sure. Um, the next mission is an orbiter, uh, the MAVEN mission. So we'll be back in 26 months. So we told the ULA guys and the Lockheed, or the uh, Kennedy Space Center folks this morning to be prepared. We are coming back. So uh, MAVEN mission is an exciting mission. It is an orbiter, as I mentioned, but it's also uh, an, ex an atmospheric escape rate mission. So one of the keys to what's happened to Mars and moving it from a, I'm talking about your category now here, poke me when I say it wrong, um, moving from, from a wet planet, in a warm and wet planet in the past to a cold, dry planet that we know now with water that's uh, significantly under the surface but at the poles, um, is what happened to the atmosphere. And MAVEN's mission is called Aronomy, and the job is to try to help understand what the escape rates of the atmosphere are now, the interaction with the solar wind, and if we can try to understand the history of the atmosphere that actually helped change the planet. So it's a planetary evolution, in a way, mission. That's the next exciting mission. Um, that's a 2013 launch. Um, and, and after that, we're still in uh, discussions with the Europeans. Uh, we're looking at, as you said, there's a number of different missions that we're planning, potentially trace gas missions, which is what we'd like to do. Uh, hopefully another lander in 18 that will uh, continue moving the science forward, that MSL will start in that new era of seeking the signs of life. Just, just a quick follow-up. How many uh, additional missions would you envision then between now and when we might actually try manned exploration of the planet? There's a series of precursor measurements that need to be done, uh, better understanding of the dust uh, and of the regolith and how it interacts with hardware and equipment, um, toxicity of the soils, um, the, how easy it is to extract water and things from, uh, from, from the materials that we have on the surface and, and maybe other materials that could be useful. Uh, that's a series of precursor missions that we actually don't have on the books quite yet. Uh, we've had years of discussion about what those might be and how to go about those things. 
uh, but there's a balance of scientific missions and human exploration precursor missions that uh, have yet to be dis discerned what that balance is going to be. Uh, the big the big issue with getting humans to Mars, frankly, is entry, descent, and landing. Uh, Pete and the team, the Mars Exploration Program, are about to put the largest vehicle on the surface ever put down, a metric ton, well, 900 kilograms to be exact. Um, when you're talking about humans to Mars, you're talking an order of magnitude almost more than that. You're talking, uh, well, a couple orders of magnitude in some cases. You're talking 40, 50, 60 kilo, or kilotons and uh, metric tons, excuse me. Um, we don't know how to do that yet. We actually don't know how to do that yet. That's more of the technology tall pole than the scientific precursor missions are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Irene? Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. In uh, one of the earlier briefings um, this week, I guess it's still, um, Mike Malin was talking about the uh, uh, huge amounts of data that will need to be coming back just from the uh, images. And I was wondering if any of you could just talk a little bit about what your plan is for managing the communications and if there's a backup in case MRO something happens with it and that's not available. You want to talk now? They seem both to be looking at me, don't they? <laughs> yeah, we uh, uh, well, we, we have a UHF relay communications plan through both Odyssey and MRO. Uh, and uh, and we do have a very very limited X band communication with the ground, uh, so uh, I think that uh, you know we will prioritize the data and send it down uh, in the priorities that both the engineers and the scientists want to have. Um, it is it is likely um, that with the uh, with the cameras being able to take so many pictures that we are going to have data that we're not going to be able to ever return. I think that we will have to prioritize and send send it uh, send it back, and that's just. The fact that our telemetry link is not as good as our data acquisition process on the planet. Um, I think that uh, we firmly expect uh, MRO. There's no reason not to believe that MRO will be there for the entire mission and into an extended mission. I think Odyssey is a little bit uh, more of a question mark, although the latest data I've had on its gas utilization indicate that it'll it is still quite an expected life. So, so that's where we are. If I can inject on that also, uh, Maven is oh, carrying true. Electra radios also. So uh, Electra radios are a software reprogrammable radio that that it does the primary uplink downlink from the surface. And so as we go through orbiters, that's why this program is set up as a program, and it's not just individual random missions. That's one of the reasons. So we will refresh that telecom capability of Odyssey and MRO when Maven flies, because it'll take a uh, an Electra radio to the planet as well. I also had a science question, maybe for you, John. Um, the uh, I was just kind of curious if the um, if this suite of instruments that are on Curiosity was on the Viking landers, do you think that the results would be any different, or do you think that the place where the Vikings landers touched down is just completely kind of antithesis to any any search for organics? Yeah. I, you know, I think if you had uh, the Viking Lander 1 and Viking Lander 2 uh, sites on the list today, they wouldn't have made it past the first uh, landing site workshop. And, you know, you sort of, in those days, you get you get what you can get to and, and hope to make the most out of it. The big difference we've got now is with the rover's capability is that we are a mobile and B, with all the instrumentation and all the people working on the mission, we have a much better chance to focus in on areas that we think are promising for the, the goals of, of investigating past habitability. Okay, Craig. Thanks, Craig Cavalt with Aerospace America. Um, kind of a lessons learned to this point question on uh, development. I think you'd agree that uh, the, the development of MSL was um, perhaps a bigger task than NASA believed it would be at the start. Uh, if you had it to do over again, what would you do differently? You want me to take that one? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would. You know, NASA's here to do the hard stuff. If we were doing the easy stuff, uh, we wouldn't be NASA, I don't believe. Uh, have we learned lessons? Yeah, we sure have. Um, we've learned lessons about how to manage certain things. We've learned lessons technically, what works, what doesn't work. We've learned lessons about lead times. Um, I, we really needed those two years that we took, uh, and it was important that we did that. It, and it was money that we're going to see real shortly is well invested. Um, but, you know, whenever you're pushing the envelope, scientifically or technically, uh, it's going to be harder than you think it is. 